Coming of Age is coming up next. I'm your host, Josh Newby. First today, we're talking about cancer prevention and early detection, two factors that can make a big difference for those battling this terrible disease. Then we'll discuss vote by mail in the upcoming election with the Escambia Supervisor of Elections. Finally, we're talking all things vaccination and why especially older adults should heed the life-saving science. Coming of Age starts right now. As we age, staying active in life and involved in the community can become a challenge. But with Council on Aging of West Florida's range of home-based services, you remain healthy, independent, and engaged. From Meals on Wheels and Respite Care to Senior Dining Sites and The Retreat, you'll feel empowered to regain your freedom while retaining what makes you, you. We've been in the community for nearly 50 years, advocating for elders and supporting those who care for our parents and grandparents. We were there when your father's health began declining, when your mother needed companionship during the day. And guess what? We'll be there down the road when you need those services too. Now, join with us as we talk together about the aging issues that matter to you. As with many diseases, prevention and early detection are important tools in the fight against cancer. Fortunately, more and more is known about the best ways to prevent cancer and new technology offers amazing ways to find cancer in its earliest stage when it's more easily treated. Today, Baptist Healthcare hematologist oncologist, Dr. Imran Joffrey is with us to talk about cancer prevention and early detection. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. My pleasure. So I understand that you've just recently joined the medical staff over there at Baptist Healthcare. Tell us a little about your background, what brought you to Pensacola, and, uh, and of course, the work you do at Baptist. Absolutely. So um, I'm originally from Pakistan. I went to med school at uh, King Edward Medical University uh, in Lahore, Pakistan. I did my residency from Abington Hospital, Jefferson Health. And I also did a chief resident year there and then fellowship from University of Connecticut um, in Connecticut. Um, so when I came for interview here at Baptist, I was really impressed and inspired by the vision of Baptist hospital leadership, as well as the leadership of the cancer program. Um, the second thing that I noticed was uh, my colleagues and staff, they were wonderful. Um, really nice people. And the third thing, Pensacola is beautiful. The beaches are beautiful. So there was no reason not to come here. Absolutely. Good to hear it. Let's, um, let's talk about cancer. Certainly a difficult subject, but hopefully, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put a bit of an optimistic spin on it today. Tell us why early detection is, is so important. Absolutely, uh, Josh. Uh, early detection is crucial because if we can detect the cancer early, we can cure it. Now, it's a, it's a concept, treatment versus cure. Mm. For example, I'll give you an example. If you get appendicitis, you take out the appendix, mm. you are cured, and you will not, not get appendicitis again. Treatment, now, cancer is not as simple as diabetes, for example, but people who have diabetes, they get treated with medication, and we can treat it, but we can never cure it. Right. Same stands true for cancer. If we detect the cancer at an early stage, we can cure it. We can get rid of it and it won't come back most of the times. But if we find it at a later stages, stage four, when it has already spread, we can only treat it. In most instances, we are unable to cure it. Okay. So that's why it's important. We can treat it well, but we cannot cure it most of the time. Gotcha. That's a, that's a good metaphor. What are some of the ways that cancer is detected and diagnosed? Absolutely. So depending on the individual cancer, uh, national societies like cancer societies, uh, USPSTF, um, they have made recommendations in terms of screening studies. For example, uh, for breast cancer, it's recommended to get regular mammograms done. For colon cancer, it's recommended to get regular colonoscopies done after the age of 50. Mm -hmm. And then for lung cancer, it's recommended to get CT scan done if uh, CT scan of the chest then if you have smoking history. Um, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, we are, there has been more awareness about all these individual screening studies. 
uh, we are as a nation, as United States nation, we are doing fairly well on breast cancer screening. We can always do better, mm. but we are doing a good job, I feel. And then colonoscopy, we are doing more and more colonoscopies. The one thing we are not doing a great job at this point is lung cancer screening. Mm. So that is something that we can all work towards. Gotcha. Now, I understand that some people are uh, more at risk for developing cancer. Tell us about Baptist's new high-risk genetics program. What is that? It's, it's a wonderful initiative from uh, Baptist Hospital. So any patient that comes to Women's Center, any, uh, anybody that shows up there for any kind of studies, they go through this questionnaire. Um, any patient that gets diagnosed with a cancer and comes to any one of our offices goes through this questionnaire. This questionnaire is called Cancer IQ. Based on that questionnaire and your answers, if you qualify, uh, we, ran, we run a genetics test uh, with Myriad Company. And it's a 35 gene panel, and that can help us identify genetic abnormalities that can cause cancer. And also, in some instances, uh, tell us whether your other family members are at an increased risk of cancer. Okay. I'm, I'm curious, doctor, who, who is a candidate for this genetic testing, and how is it actually done? Um, again, uh, so for this uh, testing, we make all of our patients go through the questionnaire, the cancer IQ questionnaire, mm -hmm. as I mentioned. And once they qualify based on their answers, for example, if they have a strong family history, if they have a history of breast cancer themselves, or family history of, for example, prostate cancer for some patients, they can, based on their answers, they can get qualified for the testing. It's a simple blood test, and then we send off the test to a company who run this uh, 35 gene panel and get us the results back. Um, after we get the result, if you're found to have a high risk uh, genetic mutation, um, our, one of our oncologists will meet with you and explain all the results and what, um, what are the implications of that, um, that mutation. Okay. Tell us what are, I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, a large portion at least of your probability for getting cancer is genetic. So what are some of the things that we can do to prevent cancer? Absolutely. I think one of the most important things um, that, that we see as oncologists uh, that is completely preventable is uh, smoking, sure. that's uh, tobacco use. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. And it can prevent head and neck cancer if you quit smoking, lung cancer. It has association with a bunch of cancers. So that's number one. Number two is um, excessive amount of alcohol. Mm. Um, that is associated with certain type of cancers as well. Um, number three is eating a fairly healthy diet and exercise sure. um, and, and um, maintaining a healthy weight. All those things help with cancer prevention. The second part of that, um, that is your screening studies, uh, identifying and knowing as a patient what screening studies do you need um, as we mature. For example, when we get to age 50, all of us need colonoscopies. Right. If we have a family history of colon cancer, we may need it earlier than age 50. And that is something that uh, your physician um, can talk to you about. Excellent, excellent information, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me, Josh. Such a pleasure. Next, we're separating the truths from the myths on mail-in voting. Stay with us. Why do people love ACTS Retirement Life Communities? There are more reasons than just the active lifestyle. Like ACTS Life Care, a plan that protects your nest egg with predictable monthly fees, even if your health care needs increase. So you can enjoy a carefree today and a worry-free tomorrow. Plan a visit and see why our satisfaction rating with current residents stands at 98%. ACTS Retirement Life Communities, where loving kindness lives. What does it look like when a life is truly changed? I feel a sense of accomplishment because I built a house. This house has brought us financial independence. It's a great place to raise a family. <laughs> Strength, fuerza. When I look back where we've come from to where we are today, it makes my heart very happy. 
potential. Potencia. For me, this house means all of us together. Stop. Do get Security. Security. Every family dreams to have their own house. This house changes our lives. Habitat for Humanity is at work in your community and around the world. Through Shelter, we empower. It's an election year, but we're also in the midst of a pandemic. So to improve turnout for one while mitigating the other has proved to be quite the challenge. But many believe that mail-in voting is the solution. Of course, now that topic has become its own source of controversy. So here to lay some of the rumors and myths to rest, as well as explain the process, is Escambia County's own Supervisor of Elections, David Stafford. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So I'd like to uh, sort of tackle this from two different sides, the sure. voter's side of things and then your office's sure. side of things. Um, take us through the mail-in voting process from the voter side of things. Okay, well, uh, it's a it's fairly straightforward. Uh, first of all, it's sort of the ground ground rules. We we've been doing it kind of the same way for uh, almost 20 years. Since 2002 is really when the structure of how we do vote by mail. Uh, that's when it really kind of came to the fore in, in the state of Florida. So we've been basically been doing it for almost two decades. Uh, so, so we have experience uh, in, in how we do it. Some of the concerns I know from other states are, are states that just don't have a lot of vote by mail and trying to uh, create something out of whole cloth uh, in a matter of months. Um, but we, so we have experience and, and, and we've been doing it. And I think we've been doing it well for, for the better part of two decades. So uh, step number one is always is registering to vote. Right. So you can't vote if you're not registered to vote. Pretty easy process. There's a deadline associated with that, October the 5th, uh, if you're not registered to vote. So once you've registered to vote, then any voter in the, in the state uh, can choose to vote by mail. Uh, and so the, the next step would be making a request. And the good news is, again, Florida makes it very easy. You can pick up the phone and call us. Uh, we, we take requests that way. We can take requests via email. Uh, we can, you can mail in a form to us or something in writing. Or the easiest way is if you have access to the internet, go to escambiavotes.gov, uh, and then there's a there's a uh, link there that you can go and request an, a, a ballot online. So number two is making that request. Now the other thing, sort of a subtext of the request, is under Florida law, uh, you, one request can be good for as as many as two full election cycles. So if someone were to, were to request a ballot today, they could, if they wanted, have that request apply to all elections between now and the 2022 general election. Okay. So you're not having to call every election cycle or every election. So you make your request. Next thing that happens is, of course, then we process that request, so we'll mail that ballot uh, out. Uh, there, there are time frames associated with that. We have a window that where we have to hit for our initial drop, so we're collecting. We have almost 60,000 vote-by-mail requests right now. Uh, so out of context, it's about 225,000 registered voters, so that's a significant right. portion. Uh, so we will, uh, some, somewhere between a month and a little bit more, uh, we'll do our initial drop uh, of vote-by-mail ballots to uh, to civilian voters. We have an earlier date that we have to hit for military and overseas voters, and that's 45 days prior. So we'll mail the ballots out. Uh, they go, uh, uh, again, we, we take them directly to the business mail entry unit of the Postal Service, so it goes directly to the postal officials, uh, and then they get it out uh, in the mail. We, we, and we just anecdotally, in the, in the primary election, we had uh, ballots hitting mailboxes literally the next day after we uh, deliver them to the post office. So you receive your ballot, uh, and then it will have instructions with it and, along with a return envelope. Uh, so study the ballot, read the instructions, uh, mark your ballot after you've made your choices. You don't have to vote for all, all contests. That's right. a common uh, question that we get. If you see one of these judicial retention races or a constitutional amendment that you just don't understand uh, or don't care enough about, uh, then you're, you're perfectly uh, able to leave that blank. All the rest of the contests where you do select a vote uh, will be counted. Once you complete your ballot, uh, fold it back up. Uh, there's a secret, what we call a secrecy sleeve that's right. associated with it. Put it back in the secrecy sleeve. And then this, this is the most important step, uh, is then you seal it back into the return envelope. A couple of things about that. Number one, postage is paid. Okay. Uh, we've done that for the first time this cycle. There's a recognition of kind of the uniqueness where we are. Uh, and so a voter doesn't have to worry about finding a stamp or affording a stamp. So postage is paid, return postage. Uh, the most important step 
is signing the back of that ballot envelope. So right. when you seal it in there, there's a big red box with a bunch of arrows and everything on there tells you you must, 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 must sign uh, your ballot, uh, ballot envelope. So sign it, and then your choices for returning it are simply putting it back in the mail stream, or you can hand deliver it or have somebody hand deliver it either to our office or when early voting begins, you can actually deliver that, that voted vote by mail ballot to any of the early voting sites. Now, so I'll, I'll only ask you uh, to speak for Escambia County, sure. obviously, because that's your uh, area of expertise. Are there possibilities of undercounting or duplicate counts or fraud or anything like that? So there's 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 a lot of checks and balances uh, uh, in place. The, the one thing, that, I mean, I think there there a lot of this unfortunately gets involved and got caught up in political mm -hmm. discourse, which you know we, we do our best to sort of keep our heads down and do our job. Uh, but just from a factual basis, you, you because part of the process is done outside the sanctity of a of a voting location where you have people that work for me and all kinds of protections in place in, in a you know sort of a a, a place to vote secure mm -hmm. where you have people watching what's going right. on. Uh, so th there is an element of risk that once that ballot leaves us. Uh, until the time it comes back to us, we don't know what happens to it. So that's why things like making sure that that, that your signature uh, is on that ballot so we can uh, uh, make sure, to, you know, to the best of our ability that it was you that returned that ballot. Um, and so there, there are a lot of uh, checks and balances in, in place. And, you know, just for us, we haven't seen a, a big problem in that. But, but there is a, a little bit, you know, more of a risk just sure. because that, that process is taking, outside, taking place outside the, the eyes of, of people like us that are watching. Is there a difference between mail-in voting and absentee voting in Florida? Or is not, it just a, a not, not in Florida. Only? Literally, they, they literally a couple of years ago they they did a lift and replace. They basically, you know, like you do on your right, computer. Right. They the literally they said wherever it says absentee, lift and replace, and say vote by mail. Okay. Uh, and so, it, and I think there's that's a recognition that you don't have to actually be absent, which is where the of course the term absentee sure. came from, dating back to the Civil War. People that were uh, away from home. Uh, had to have a way to be able to, to vote in the election. So uh, the, to me, the biggest difference, um, I think the real kind of substantial difference, and again, not making value judgments on which one's better than the other, is a state like Florida where you have to make an, a request. Mm -hmm. I, anybody can make a request, but you have to make a request first. And then you have other states like Oregon, Washington State, uh, where they will mail you a ballot right. if you're a registered voter. Gotcha. Uh, so that, to me, that's really the only significant difference in the two. We have just about a minute left, sure. but I want to get you to answer this. Uh, are mail-in ball ballots counted on election? Because it seems like it would take longer sure. to no, count. They're actually the first, ba first, first ballots. Uh, we, okay. can, we can start counting them up to three weeks in advance, okay. which is why uh, one of the unique things about Florida is all, you hear all this, well, we're not going to know who won the election until weeks right. after. In Florida, within the first 30 minutes of the polls closing, uh, we, my colleagues and I have to report all of our early vote results in every vote-by-mail ballot that we've uh, tabulated up to that point, which in most elections is substantially more than half, usually about two-thirds or more of the ballots, total ballots cast. So within 30 minutes, you'll have a pretty good idea Excellent. of which way Florida's going. Excellent. Great information. Very timely, David. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Next, vaccines have recently become a controversial topic. We're separating fact from fiction. Stay with us. Since 1989, TLC Caregivers has been providing the special help people need to stay independent in their own homes. TLC is an employer of choice in the home care market. Our employees are screened with level two background screens, drug-free and have caregiving experience. If you have time, enjoy people, and are interested in joining us, go to tlccaregivers.com to learn more about becoming a TLC caregiver or visit us in Cordova Square. When cancer tries to take you away from the things that matter most, Baptist Cancer Institute offers caring physicians and the most innovative treatment options. With convenient locations and a wide array of support programs and services, we're here to help you during the most difficult of times. As a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network, we're bringing even more innovative cancer care to our community right here at home. When you need cancer care, we'll be there.
Some of the world's most dreadful diseases, measles, polio, diphtheria, and more, have been largely eradicated thanks to one of science's most miraculous discoveries. That by introducing the body to a weakened version of a disease-causing germ, our immune system can remember how to destroy the deadly variety of the sickness on its own. But controversy swirls around this practice and around the soon-expected COVID-19 vaccine. Let's talk through some of this controversy and myths surrounding immunization with two experts from the health department. Ladies, thank you both for joining me today. Thanks good, for having good us. Good to be here. I know COVID-19 is, is dominating the conversation right now, but there is a flu season uh, that we have to get to. Um, so let's briefly talk about that. What are some of the myths about the flu vaccine and, and why is it so important to get a shot? Uh, well, and, and thank you for bringing up the importance of vaccines. Uh, you know, in, in the time between 1900 and 2000, the U.S. Life, life expectancy expanded by about 30 or 40 years, and that's due in large part to vaccine preventable mm -hmm. disease protections. Um, and so flu vaccine is a common one we see um, every year. We ask people to get a flu vaccine. And one of the common myths is that when you get a flu vaccine, you get the flu. Right. And, and we do know that sometimes people may have feel some symptoms, mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily related to flu, but other viruses that are circulating. Sure. But we do know that vaccine does not give flu disease. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one common one. Another one is maybe we don't need to take a vaccine for flu every year. Right. But um, as time progresses each year, our body's immunity that was related to that vaccine declines over time. So getting that annual flu shot gives you a booster effect. Definitely. And also, um, we know that the different types of flu viruses that circulate each year can kind of vary from year to year. So as max vaccines are manufactured, um, they take that into account and they try to build a vaccine that is the best match to what's going around in the community at that time. Okay. Um, there's a possible second wave, right, of, of COVID. Why is it so important to get the flu vaccine, especially during a, a pandemic? Uh, well, it's always important to get a flu true, vaccine. True. But but uh, during this pandemic, um, number one, protects you more from flu-like illness, the flu, mm -hmm. um, and also helps to dif differentiate um, the cause of an illness. So you know if you've been vaccinated against the flu and you're feeling flu-like symptoms, um, the doctor that you see can look at what are the other possibilities that are causing those illnesses. And in the time of COVID, we want to be able to rule that out as quickly as possible. So, yeah. so it's very important. Definitely. Uh, we've recently seen, I've personally seen, a sort of national resurgence in vaccine skepticism, whether uh, you know it's the ingredients in them or, or the regimen for young children. There's, there's just a lot of controversy swirling right now, um, as with everything. What do you say to, to the vaccine skeptics? Well, you know, any issues that, that have been brought up typically don't come from data. Sure. The data that we have shows that, that vaccines are effective and they're, and they're safe. And the recommendations are, you know, continue, starting at six months um, of age and older, people can get a flu vaccine with very few exceptions. Sure. Um, there are some, you know, occasional exceptions to that, but, but recommending that for everybody, uh, especially for those um, with increased risk for um, complications or flu-related um, symptoms that can lead them into a, a heavier type of disease. Definitely. So. Talk about the uh, the importance of vaccines and the regimen for older adults, especially. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Lee talk about sure, that. Sure, Lee. Okay. Um, vaccines are really important. Um, in children, and most people, when they think of vaccines, they think of children getting vaccines, but they're really important throughout the lifespan. So when you um, um, enter retirement age, <laughs> um, you should make sure you have a tetanus shot every 10, e 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, real important included with that is pertussis. There's a vaccine called the Tdap and that prevents whooping cough, which can be transmitted to grandchildren mm -hmm. um, through a cough-like illness. So that's one of them. Uh, another one is pneumonia vaccines. There's two of those um, to make sure that you get. Uh, one's Pneumovax and the other, other one is Prevnar. So those are very important to have as complications of flu-like illnesses and um, that sort of thing. Flu every year, That's right. of course. And then the last one is gonna be your shingles vaccine. Right. So. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, we, we uh, deal with a lot of older people, of course, and some of them are reluctant to take their vaccines. 
Uh, but what we find can always be very persuasive is if you don't get it for you, get it for your grandkids. Absolutely. Right? Because th their love for their grandkids is oftentimes even greater than their love for themselves. What won't you do for your grandkids? Exactly, anything. Right. Um, talk about herd immunity. We've, we've heard that phrase tossed around a lot. Obviously, it's incredibly important. But, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm not even sure exactly what it means, what that percentage looks like. What is herd immunity? Okay, I'm, I do want to say another important point to remember about older adults sure. getting vaccines is um, just to reinforce, as we get older, and it happens to all of us, hopefully, um, our immune function is not as sharp or quick to respond. Sure. So getting those vaccines that are um, particularly protective against those risks for very severe diseases as we get older um, helps us to live a longer, healthier life. So Definitely. that's important. And herd immunity is another important part of that. Um, the more people that are immuno, immune protected mm -hmm. um, against the disease, the less likely it is to be transmitted to those people who can't be exposed or haven't been exposed. Right. So um, if everyone in the room um, has been vaccinated against the flu, except for me, because for some reason I can't get the flu vaccine, then they're less likely to transmit the disease to me because they're not gonna carry it. Sure. So, so getting people in the community vaccinated against all of those preventable diseases is important. Is there, is there a certain um, percentage that is generally considered herd immunity? I mean, obviously, I'm sure it's different for different ailments, but is there a, is there a ballpark? Um, and, it, and it is, and Lee may have a better um, idea on that. Example, measles. Sure. Uh, once the herd immunity drops below 90%, then oh, wow. you start to see a resurgence that of high. disease. Okay. And that's the, one of the most visible things. They had an outbreak in, in Disneyland not too long right. ago. And um, so it's popping back up because herd immunity is dropping. I didn't realize it was e even that high a threshold. Um, that's... It, like you mentioned, it varies from disease right, to disease, course. but that's the most dramatic one. Wow, interesting. Well, I mean, vaccines obviously extremely important. Um, Council on Aging is a big uh, supporter, proponent of older folks, especially getting their vaccine. Um, get your flu shot, right? Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Thank you folks both for coming on. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And until next time, enjoy life. You've earned it.